Hello, everyone. I'm Kirsten Henson, and I'm a partner and managing attorney with the law firm of K. Bender Rembaum. For those of you who are not familiar with the firm, our main office is in South Florida, in Pompano Beach, Florida, but we do have offices in other locations, uh, Palm Beach Gardens, Orlando, and as Jeff mentioned, uh, we do have an office uh, on the West Coast located here in Tampa. We are a full-service community association law firm. We have 22 attorneys throughout the state. Uh, we do collections for closures uh, in-house. We do dispute resolution. Uh, in summary, we represent uh, homeowners, uh, condominium, and cooperative associations. I've been practicing law for 16 years, uh, and I've been with the firm uh, 14 of those. All right, so with that said, let me share my screen. Looking good so far. All right. There we go. Yeah, we got it. Here we go. All right. Jumping into the present, we're going to talk about updating your governing documents. I can't emphasize enough how important this topic um, is. Uh, many boards uh, either overlook uh, this this topic or issue or just, you know, get bugged down with, with other operational uh, matters involving the association. But taking a look at your governing documents uh, and discussing uh, areas for amendment with your legal counsel is so important especially in light of uh, new legislation. All right, well, let's talk about, let's start with talking about uh, the hierarchy of your governing documents. Um, for those of you that are new board members, I'm sure you've seen uh, at least three documents uh, that uh, comprise your governing documents. If you're in a condominium association, you will have a declaration of condominium. If you're in a homeowner association, you will have a declaration of covenants and restrictions, okay? And then regardless of whether you're in condominium or an HOA, you will also have uh, articles of incorporation and then bylaws, okay? So in terms of hierarchy, your declaration is going to be your supreme document. It is really the contract between the association and the owners that uh, purchase units or lots in the community. Okay. And that is the document that's going to contain your uh, use restrictions. Okay, Can you uh, have pets? Do you require uh, purchasers to get um, board approval? It's going to have your architectural uh, control provisions. Okay, It's going to have uh, your... Um, uh, it's going to have a clause about assessments and uh, lien collections for closures. Okay, that's going to be in your declaration. Now, your articles it really set out the corporate structure of the association. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, the association is a not-for-profit entity. So it is governed under Chapter 617 of the Florida statute, which governs not-for-profit corporations. And then depending if you're a condominium or an HOA, you will be governed either under 718 of the Florida statute or 720. So the Articles of Incorporation is the document that basically established the entity. Okay, It's filed with the Division of Corporation in Tallahassee. And every time you amend your Articles of Incorporation, you will have to file that amendment in Tallahassee as well before you can record it in the public record. So the articles will set out, for example, you know, who qualifies as a member in your community, typically record owners, who qualifies as a director, uh, as an officer. Um, and then the bylaws are going to be more of an extension of what your articles already provide. So we'll have a little bit more detail. Uh, it'll discuss uh, elections, it'll discuss notice requirements, membership, board of directors meetings. Uh, it'll, it'll have a provision about the, um, the uh, duties of the officers. So that's those are your three documents, your declaration, articles, and then bylaws. <clears throat> if there's ever a conflict between the articles and the bylaws, the articles will control. OK, so when amending your articles or your bylaws, 
you always want to make sure that you check the other document to make sure there's no conflict. Believe it or not, even attorneys overlook that. Okay. Now, you might also have rules, regulations, uh, and even architectural guidelines. Okay. Now, these do not uh, form part of your governing documents. They are a separate um, set of documents, essentially separate rules, uh, policies, and guidelines. All right. So let's talk briefly about the amendment process before we talk about more of the substantive issues that you should be looking uh, to see whether you might need to amend your governing documents. So if you're looking to amend either one of these documents, any amendment um, has to be uh, designated with underlines and, and, and strike throughs. Okay, both uh, 718 and 720 require that for any amendment, if you're going to add new language, the new language has to be designated with underlines. If you're going to remove language from uh, any of the governing documents, you have to designate that with putting a strike through uh, over the language that you're removing. Now, if you're doing a document rewrite, okay, where you're going to have uh, a lot of underlines and strike throughs, um, you have an alternative option, which both statutes provide. So instead of doing underlines and strike throughs, uh, you have the option of uh, not designating, not showing the underlines and strike throughs uh, on your changes, rather adding language at the top or the beginning of the document you're amending um, and, and words to the effect of, you know, substantial rewarding of the governing document. Please review your original documents for the original language or words to that effect. So that's an option. Now, whether for your community you should um, you should present your amendments with the substantial rewarding language or with underlines or strike throughs, that that's a conversation that you 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 should have with your legal counsel. Now, once you've drafted your amendments, right? More likely than not, you will have to present those amendments to the membership for approval, okay? Now, approval can take one of two ways. Owners uh, have the option of approving uh, amendment at a membership meeting, or there is an alternative option, okay? Approval by the written consent process in lieu of a meeting. So let's take the meeting first. If you're going to present amendments to the owners at a meeting, it could be either at your annual meeting or a special membership meeting. Now, for most associations, you are required uh, to have at least one membership meeting, which is your annual election meeting. And for most, that will typically be the one and only meeting of the members that you will have that year. You are allowed to have the special membership meetings for other uh, matters that which uh, owners need to vote on, such as amendments, or if you're in a condominium, you might, uh, depending on uh, your condominium, you might have owners waive reserves. So whatever issue owners are entitled to vote on, that will take place at a membership meeting. Now, in lieu of a membership meeting, uh, you have the option of presenting uh, amendments to the owners for approval by the written consent process. And the consent process is essentially you'll mail to the owners a consent form, a little memorandum that will describe what you're trying to amend, and then it will have a signature line at the bottom of the form. So if the owner approves the amendment, is in favor of the amendment, all the owner has to do is sign that consent form and return it to the association. You don't need to have any meeting for that. Uh, now, the authority to um, for the owners to approve uh, actions or amendments in this case uh, through the written consent process uh, will depend. If you're in a condominium, you have to have specific authority in your governing documents. Okay, so your documents have to expressly allow owners to approve actions by the written consent process. If you are in an HOA under governed under Chapter 720, then so long as there is no express provision in your governing documents prohibiting uh, voting or approval by the written consent process, it means that you can't. Okay, so you can present these amendments to the owners through that written consent process. Now, with the written consent process, 
once you mail out the consent form, the memo with the consent form, along with a copy of the amendment, because the owners will need to see what you're trying to amend, you have 90 days from the date that you receive the first executed consent form. Okay, You have 90 days to get the necessary approval. So if your documents require approval of the majority of the owners, you have 90 days to get that vote from that first executed consent form. Now, let's say you're going to present your amendments to the owners uh, at a membership meeting. Okay, so with the notice of the membership meeting, you're going to mail to the owners, obviously, a copy of the proposed amendment, as well as a limited proxy. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that limited proxy is also good for 90 days from the date of the first meeting. So let's say you set your first meeting uh, to be October 1st. You have 90 days from October 1st to collect the necessary votes that you need to get the amendment passed. So as you're getting limited proxies back from owners, and unlike with elections, you are allowed to open the proxies and start tallying the votes on the proxy, proxy. by the time you reach the meeting date, you, you should have a good idea of whether your amendment will pass or not. So if you see that you still don't have enough votes, okay, on the date of your meeting, you have the option of, rather than adjourning the meeting, recessing and reconvening that meeting, and you can do that for as many times as you need, up to the 90th day from the date of the first, uh, or the date of the original meeting, okay? So there is a process uh, uh, by which you have to recess and reconvene the meeting. And if you do it properly, then again, you can hold a subsequent meeting to that. And in between, you know, do mail outs, uh, knock on doors, uh, you know, whatever is necessary to get uh, the votes back. Now, once that 90th day, uh, once you reach that 90th day, if you don't get the necessary votes, then essentially the issue dies. Okay. And if you want to continue, um, on a campaign to try to get uh, the votes, then you'll basically have to start the process again and re-notice uh, the meeting. So start a new meeting with a new proxy. Now, distribution to members. So you have the option of, <clears throat> of mailing the notice with a limited proxy and amendment or the written consent form with the amendments to the owners either by mail you can hand deliver the documents to the owners, or you can electronically transmit those documents to the owners, to those owners who have consented to receiving notices by um, electronic means, which could be email or fax. So if you have a, a written consent form from an owner to receiving notices electronically, then yes, you can email the package to them. Otherwise, you'll have to uh, use one of the other uh, forms of distribution, mail or hand delivery. Now, vote tally. So this has to do with basically the percentage of votes that you need to get your amendment passed. Now, each document is going to have its own specific requirement for amending. So if you're looking to amend the declaration, you have to look at the declaration to see what is the voting percentage required to amend the deck. Okay? If you're looking to amend the bylaws, then you have to look at the bylaws. Occasionally, um, you, I've, I've, I've come across where articles of incorporation or the bylaws include a voting percentage for amending another document. So as a practical tip, just a good idea to check all three documents, make sure there's no conflicting language as to the percentage of votes you need to amend a specific document. And if you do have conflicting language, then that should be amended out. If your documents are silent on a voting percentage, then for both um, HOAs and condominiums, you would need a vote of two thirds of the owners to approve amendments, okay? Now let's say you have a relatively high voting percentage to amend, and that typically could be 75% of the voting interest or even two thirds, depending on how big your community is. Then as a practical tip, the first thing that you might wanna consider is putting out an amendment to the owners to reduce the voting percentage you need to amend the document. So reducing it from 75% or two thirds to maybe something more manageable like a majority of the owners 
or even a majority of the owners who are present at a meeting at which quorum is established, which is a majority of quorum as opposed to a majority of all the owners. Again, that's something you might want to uh, discuss with your legal counsel to see if it's a, you know, a practical uh, thing to do in your case. <clears throat> Now, there are certain types of amendments that are considered material. So, for instance, if you're looking to modify the percentage by which owners uh, pay assessments, or if you're looking to modify in condominiums the percentage by which owners own the common element, those are typically considered material amendments. And under the statute, they will require a vote of 100% of the owners and their mortgagees. This is why it's typically very difficult to change the percentage of assessments that owners pay, especially in a condominium, okay? Because it just requires um, uh, an unduly burdensome voting percentage. Now, you might uh, be considering amending your declaration to address leases, leases okay? Now, leasing uh, is addressed in both the 718 and 720, okay? And you wanna be mindful if, if you are amending uh, your declaration to either prohibit leasing or impose a lease moratorium or some kind of rental cap. The statute, the condominium statute provides that if you are amending your declaration uh, to prohibit leasing or um, to impose a lease moratorium or in any way affecting leasing in your condominium, then those amendments would only be effective against owners who vote in favor of the amendment and those who take title after the amendment is recorded in the public records, which is when the amendment becomes effective. And in uh, 2021 and 2021, uh, the Homeowners Association um, Statute Chapter 720 uh, amended uh, the, uh, the legislature amended the statute to include a similar provision for a homeowner association. So, again, you want to be mindful of, of, of this um, provision in the statute. Now, whether that applies to you or not, that's going to depend on whether you have Kaufman language in your declaration. And we're going to talk about that um, in, in a few minutes. Now, suspension of voting rights, you know, this could be uh, potentially an effective tool for some communities to get an amendment passed. Uh, and essentially what uh, 720 and 718 uh, provide is if an owner is uh, delinquent on any monetary obligation to the association for more than 90 days, the board can suspend voting rights. Now, this is something that's done, uh, that should be done really before you're going to present to the owners the amendment for approval, right? So the voting rights would need to have been suspended prior to getting the votes back, okay? Because it is a board action. And uh, if you're looking to suspend voting rights, we'll require notice of that board meeting to be posted at least 48 hours prior to the board meeting, okay? Now, <laughs> excuse me, with condominiums, not only is the owner, uh, does the owner need to be delinquent on a monetary obligation to the association for at least 90 days, but the monetary obligation has to be also at least $1,000. Okay, assuming uh, these requirements are met and you have properly suspended voting rights, then that will reduce the number of votes that you will need to get an amendment passed. So, for example, let's take a community that has 100 units or 100 lots, and you need the approval of a majority of the owners to get an amendment passed. That would be 50% plus one. Well, if you have uh, properly suspended the voting rights, let's say, of 10 uh, delinquent owners, then you would need to get the approval of a majority of the 90 owners, not, not the majority of the 100 owners. Okay? Similarly, for purposes of establishing quorum, if your quorum requirement uh, in a condominium, let's say it's a majority of the owners, or if you're in an HOA, if it's at least 30%, then again, it would be uh, you know, a majority or 30% of the 90, not of the 100 owners. Now, mortgagee approval. 
it's very possible that you might have a provision in your document that requires you to get the consent of those uh, mortgagees uh, <clears throat> that uh, the lenders that uh, have provided mortgages um, for homeowners. If the amendment is one that affects the rights of these mortgagees. Okay. So both 718 and 720 do provide a statutory process by which you would have to get mortgagee consent. But you want to be mindful because if you don't get the uh, mortgagee consent, if one is required in your case, then um, the, the, the mortgagee might have a basis to successfully challenge the amendment um, you know, if you're ever in a position to enforce uh, the amendment against the mortgagee, right, on the basis that you just didn't get the mortgagee consent uh, as required in your documents. Now, the mortgagee would have only five years to successfully challenge that amendment, and it's five years from the date that the amendment is recorded in the public records, okay? All right, so that's generally the amendment process that you would be following. Now let's look at some uh, misconceptions, right? Some, and, and there, and, and you might have a hundred reasons for amending. So um, certainly the next few slides are not all inclusive. Um, they just represent some of the most common misconceptions um, that, that we have seen. Now, what provisions are illegal? <clears throat> Essentially, any provision that is discriminatory violates the Fair Housing uh, Act, federal or Florida, uh, would be illegal. So, uh, for example, if you are a community that is not technically classified as a housing for older persons, and you have a provision that restricts uh, the uh, occupancy of a unit or a lot by children under the age of 18, that is a problematic uh, provision uh, in your uh, document. So you might want to consider amending that out. Okay. Other than that, generally, most amendments to the governing documents, to your declaration, uh, as long as it was properly approved, are enforceable. Now let's see what provisions are holding you back or possibly costing you money. So the first misconception, a foreclosing lender is required to pay 1% of the original mortgage debt or 12 months of delinquent assessment. Is that true or false? Well, it's true in the sense that this, that this is what 718 and 720 provide, right? These are known as the safe safe harbor provisions, right? And what it says is that if a mortgagee forecloses on a unit and takes title, then that mortgagee owes the association either 1% of the original mortgage debt or 12 months of delinquent assessments. But is your association guaranteed this money? It is not. So what you want to do is you want to look at your declaration. You want to look to see whether your declaration is providing mortgagees greater protection. You might have a clause in your declaration that says a mortgagee that takes title to a property in your community owes nothing to the association. And some of the older documents contain this language. Okay, so what's been happening is that mortgagees have been using these clauses in declarations to successfully get out of paying any monies owed to the association that accrued prior to taking title. Okay, so take a look at your documents. And if you have such a clause, then consider amending it out. Now, as a practical tip, that type of clause will typically require mortgagee consent. Remember, I just talked a few minutes ago that uh, it's quite possible that an amendment to your documents that affect mortgagee rights might require mortgagee consent. This could be one of those. Okay, so speak with legal counsel about what the process would be in getting mortgagee consent. It's not that it's uh, it's not a burdensome process, but it is one that you have to follow. Okay, and typically requires uh, what is known as a negative notice. So after you have confirmed the lots or the units that have mortgagees. 
you will have to notify, send a letter to the uh, uh, mortgage lenders letting them know that you're looking to amend the declaration. This is the clause that you're amending. And then if, if, the, mortgagee, um, if the mortgagee has any objections, they will they need to respond back otherwise if the mortgagee does not respond back then their consent is presumed and you can go ahead and record the amendment provided it's properly adopted by the unit owners okay uh the, the process is it has a little bit more detail than what i've described so again i encourage you to speak with your legal counsel about that all right another misconception all new owners must go through the screening process in our community, true or false? Well, you might say, yes, every owner in our community has to submit an application. We have to run a background check, credit and, and a, a criminal background check, and they have to pay an application fee. Well, but the question is, is that um, authority to approve or disapprove these applicants, is that in your declaration? or is that in a rule or a policy that the board adopted? Okay, because the authority really needs to be in your declaration to be enforceable, not as a separate rule or as a separate policy that the board has adopted. Okay, so check your governing documents. If you don't have that authority, consider amending to give you that authority. And you know, you might wanna have the ability to approve or disapprove not just buyers in your community, but what about tenants? What about additional occupants, okay, that come and occupy the unit after the initial purchaser or the initial tenant was already screened? What about conveyances such as quick claim deeds? Let's say an owner has purchased a unit and then quick, claim de quick claims the deed to another family member. Or let, let's say adds a spouse to the deed after um, the, the buyer has already been screened. Do you want to have the ability to approve or disapprove those types of conveyances? All of this needs to be spelled out in your declaration, specifically with sales. You might have heard of, you know, right of first refusal. It's not enough that you have a provision that says the board has the ability to approve or disapprove sales or other transfers of title. <clears throat> Under Florida law, such an amendment or such a clause also has to have right of first refusal language, which means the, the association has to have a corresponding obligation to provide an alternate purchaser if it disapproves a transfer or sale of a unit for reasons other than good cause. So a good cause could be negative criminal history or negative financial history. But if you're going to disapprove for reasons other than good cause, okay, then you will uh, have uh, a legal obligation to provide an alternate purchaser that will buy the unit under the same terms and conditions. That language, unfortunately, has to be in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the sale approval process in order to be valid. So you might have an outdated uh, provision. Check your documents to confirm. Now, some of the older documents might have a provision that exempts mortgagees from the approval process when that mortgagee takes title uh, through foreclosure. And that's not unusual, right? You can't really screen a mortgagee. But the provision can go beyond that and exempt any, uh, any buyer who buys from that mortgagee. Well, you might want to consider amending so that any buyer that buys from the mortgagee would have to go through the same approval process just like anyone else. Or you might have governing documents that exempt certain family members from the approval process. Do you want those family members to be exempt or do you want to have them screened? Again, that's a conversation you want to have uh, amongst the board members and certainly with your legal counsel. All right, the next misconception. Once the law changes, the change is automatically applicable to your community. Okay, this is a, a very hot topic, especially in light of some of the legislation that uh, went into effect July 1st. Uh, one that, uh, you know, comes to mind that, um, 
you know, board members are up in arms about is the change to the uh, to Chapter 720 that says that communities can't prohibit trucks or commercial vehicles from parking within the community. Okay, well, does that change apply to your community? That will depend on whether or not you have the magical words uh, called Kaufman. Okay. And Kaufman refers to the words amended from time to time that you uh, might find after reference to either 718 or 720 of the, um, uh, of the Florida statute. And typically, you will find that around the first page of your declaration. Um, the, the introduction of your declaration might say that your community is, has been construed or the community is subject to uh, and the documents are construed under Chapter 720 or 718 of the Florida statute as amended from time to time. If you have that language, it means you have Kaufman language. And that means that substantive changes to the Florida statute will retroactively apply to your declaration and your community. Now, let me backtrack a little bit. And again, this is a very complicated uh, area of the law, but Essentially, there are there are two types of changes that a Florida uh, legislature will make to the statute, either procedural or substantive. Now, procedural changes uh, address uh, procedure. For example, in a condominium setting, the way you run elections in a condominium, right? As of now, all condominiums have to mail out a first notice and then a second notice of the annual meeting. So anytime the legislator changes anything uh, having to do with the procedure of how you uh, conduct your elections or the fining procedure or procedure for suspending voting rights, for example, those changes will apply to your community regardless of whether or not you have Kaufman. Now, substantive changes to the Florida statute affect the vested rights of owners. So for example, when the legislature passed uh, the law that uh, HOA communities cannot prohibit trucks or commercial vehicles in the community, that is a substantive change that affects the vested rights of owners. Well, uh, a very basic premise uh, in the law is that the legislature cannot retroactively impair contractual rights. So remember I said the declaration is a contract between the association and the owners. So the legislature cannot retroactively impair provisions that you already have in the declaration. So if you don't have Kaufman language, then substantive changes to the statute should not apply retroactively. The law that was in effect at the time your declaration was recorded in the public records is the law that should apply. Okay, so whether certain changes in the statute apply or not to your community is an analysis that your legal counsel is going to have to do. So you want to reach out to your uh, to your legal counsel to figure out what provisions in your declaration you can still enforce and what is affected by um, by changes in the statute. <clears throat> All right, another misconception. The board must obtain a vote of the owners before making a material alteration. Well, that's false. With condominium associations, the, uh, the statute does provide that unless otherwise provided in the declaration, a material alteration to uh, a common element will require a vote of at least 75% of the voting interest. Okay, but unless otherwise provided in your declaration, so you're going to have to look at your declaration to see if you have a different voting requirement. You might have a lower threshold. You might have a requirement to get only a, a vote of the majority of the owners. You might have a dollar threshold requirement. So uh, the board can spend uh, a certain amount of money on a material alteration, but anything that exceeds uh, that threshold will require a uh, member vote, okay? So again, you're gonna have to look at your declaration to see what is required for the board to undertake a material alteration, such as painting of your exterior uh, building. For homeowners association, there's nothing in the statute that addresses material alteration. That really is a concept, you know, for the 
mostly for condominiums. But you're going to have to look at your uh, declaration or even bylaws to see if there's anything um, addressing uh, the board's um, alteration uh, or changes to common areas, community property. And typically you will find um, you will you will find a restriction um, on alteration um, uh, having to do more of a uh, um, imposing a limitation on an expenditure. So the board cannot expend more than X amount of funds each year uh, on alterations or changes, uh, or you can't expend certain amount of money. Anything above that will require membership approval. So with HOAs, you definitely have to look at your governing documents. Now, there is an exception under the law for um, uh, material alterations, and that is known as a necessary maintenance exception. So if um, the work that you are doing is part of a necessary maintenance of the association, right? It's your obligation to maintain these common elements or common areas. You have to do the work, but the work might entail a material alteration, then there is an exception of the law that membership approval might not be necessary if this is part of um, a necessary obligation of the association. That line of whether this is a necessary maintenance or not sometimes is not as clear, so I encourage you to seek guidance of your uh, legal counsel uh, before you um, undertake a material alteration. All right, another misconception. Delinquent assessments accrue interest at the rate of 18% and a $25 late fee applies. Well, this is, this is what both 718 and 720 provide. But is this automatic to your community? M maybe, maybe not. You, you're going to have to look at your governing documents. With regard to late fees, the authority to charge a late fee has to be set forth in your declaration or your bylaws, okay? Many boards believe that they just have this automatic ability to charge late fees if an owner's delinquent on assessments. That's not true. So if you were to turn a, a delinquent owner to our office for collections, we will check your governing documents to confirm whether or not you have the ability to uh, apply a late fee. And if you don't, we will not pursue collections of those late fees, okay? With interest, interest can be charged at the rate provided in the declaration. For HOAs, interest can be charged at the rate that's provided either in your declaration or your bylaws. And if there's no rate, 18% applies. But if you're one of those communities that have some of the older documents, you might have a rate set at you know 10% or something even less. Well, if your documents already address an interest rate, that is the rate that you have to apply, not the 18%. So you might want to check and then amend as necessary. Okay. <clears throat> For kind of minimum associations, if a pipe and a wall only provides services to one unit, that unit owner is responsible for the maintenance. Is that true or false? Well, it will depend, and it will depend on your governing documents. Your declaration is what's going to dictate the maintenance obligations of the owners and of the association. So a very common example is, for example, you have a toilet, you have the, the, the concrete floor, and then you have a pipe that leads from the toilet to the main stack in the condominium buildings. And you might have um, a board that believes that that pipe that's going from the toilet to the main stack because it services that particular toilet, no other toilet, that is a maintenance responsibility of the owner if any, any issue arises with that particular pipe. Well, again, that is something that is very specific to your community. That could be addressing your declaration as a common element, in which case it doesn't matter if it only services one toilet. It's a common element pipe and therefore the obligation of the association to maintain. So if something is a maintenance obligation of the association, you can't just shift that maintenance responsibilities to the owners 
And especially, you know, I, I've, I've heard this a lot. Well, but this is how we've been doing things, you know, for the last 30 years. Well, that doesn't make it right if that is uh, not what your declaration uh, provides. So check your declaration and confirm whether the maintenance obligation set forth therein is in line with how you operate. You may have shifted things around, okay, but that needs to be shifted in your declaration as well in order to be enforceable, okay? So you might need to consider an amendment. Now, for condominiums, you might also be uh, want to be on the lookout for language, uh, for incidental damage language. Now, incidental damage is uh, damage that arises from the association uh, undertaking, you know, its maintenance responsibility over the common elements, for example, and then any damage that arises or is incident to to that uh, maintenance repair. So a common example is if the association has to go through a backsplash in the kitchen in order to get to a common element pipe. If you have incidental damage in your declaration, then the association could be on the hook for replacing that backsplash, okay? So it could potentially cost the association a lot of money, okay, if you have this incidental damage language. So discuss with legal counsel if this is something you want to amend out of your declaration. Now, you might also have language in your declaration given the association self-help remedy. <laughs> Excuse me. Self-help remedy refers to <clears throat> the ability of the association to perform or undertake the uh, maintenance obligation of the owner if the owner fails to do so. And then the documents might give the uh, association the ability to recover that expense as an individual special assessment against the owner. So, for example, if the owner hasn't maintained uh, a certain pipe and you have self-help remedy, then the association is able to go repair that pipe and then charge the owner for the repairs. And if the owner doesn't voluntarily pay, then provided the authorities in your governing documents, you might have the ability to recover that expense as a special assessment against that particular owner. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, caution with self-help remedy, if you have it in your documents, is that case law has come out in the state of Florida from multiple districts now that say, if you have self-help remedy, then the association is required to first undertake the self-help remedy or at least attempt before the association tries and files legal action against the owner to force the owner to undertake um, the, um, the obligation. Now, you know, self-help remedy, you really have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. It might not always be um, the best course of action. Uh, it could expose the association to potential liability or other damages. So you really have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. But if it is in uh, a situation where the association would have preferred to pursue legal action, you know, first mediation, and then if necessary, file legal action to force the owner to undertake his or her maintenance responsibilities, then if you have self-help remedy, then you won't be able to exercise that right until you've at least tried um, to exercise self-help remedy yourself, okay? So essentially, you know, discuss with legal counsel whether for your particular community, uh, you want to have self-help remedy in your document, if in fact you have it. And if you don't, um, then consider, you know, amending it out. All right, so we're at the end of the, uh, the webinar. What have we learned today? Well, we've learned that safe harbor and mortgagee liability may be limited by old language in your documents. We've learned that you might be losing money from interest or late fees if your documents are old, outdated. We've learned that new laws may or may not apply to your association, depending on whether you have Kaplan language in the governing documents. And again, this is a this is a complicated analysis that your legal counsel, um, you know, should be should be doing um, in um, 
helping you figure out whether or not you want to have Kaufman uh, in your documents. And then old language and documents could be exposed in the association to discrimination claims, okay, especially some of the older documents. So if you haven't considered amending your documents or at least having your legal counsel review them and give you further guidance on what should be taken out or what should be amended, now is a good time to have the discussion. All right, and the last slide, just for fun, healthcare alert. Owning a home in an HOA may be hazardous to your health. 